fill out the Connect card. If you're here in person, it's in the seat back right in front of you. If you're online or if you're just a tech-savvy person and prefer, there is a Bridge NC app that you can use to fill out that Connect card. And let me tell you why. Because we want you to get connected here. There are so many things going on at the Bridge, and using that Connect card is a great way to have somebody from our team reach out to you and say, hey, how can I get you connected? What's your next step? You'll see we've got the baptism pool up. We have a baptism today, second service, which is amazing. And maybe that's your next step. You will find all of that out. We will connect with you using that Connect card. So please take the opportunity to do that right now. Also, I wanna let you know that Bridge Kids is such a huge, huge part of our service here, our ministries here. And we have a need for people whose hearts are for children. If you wanna teach children, if you wanna help children learn about Jesus, we have opportunities for you to serve. We've had so many key families and key leaders who have PCS because you know we are in a military family. We love our military people, but they have PCS and we need some more wonderful people with open hearts for children. So if that's you, there's a table in the lobby to sign up for Bridge Kids today. We would be so excited to have you come alongside us in this journey. Our kids need loving people who will care about them and share the word and the truth with them. And maybe that's you today. So many things going on in the month of May from May 10th through the last, those three Wednesdays in May. We are gonna have family fun sports nights. Woo, it's gonna be amazing. And guess what? You don't have to have any athletic ability whatsoever. I told everybody in first service, we will play kickball and we will roll the ball right to you and you can kick it. And then Pastor Ryan has volunteered to run for everybody who cannot run, okay? So take full advantage of that. He'll run the bases for you. It'll be great. We'll get all his steps in that night. So I want you guys to take the opportunity to come join us for that. It's gonna be fun. It's for the whole family. Get everybody out there. Let's just play some sports and have a great time together. We'll bring the Gatorades. You bring yourselves, your family and friends, and we're gonna have a great time. There's a registration online. I do want you to touch it and to uh, go to that registration and go ahead and fill it out because it'll give you all the details of all the information, tell you where, when, dates, times, all the good things. So please do that. It's going to be a great time. We cannot wait for that event, those events through May. So a couple more things going on. We are getting ready to end a series today, and we're going to start a new one next week. It is a wisdom series. And can I get an amen that we all need some wisdom? Yes, wisdom. Woo! All right, and not only are we gonna start a series on wisdom, we're gonna be in Proverbs, but we have the opportunity to get some wisdom daily to our phones. And I don't know about all the junk that's on your phone, but all the junk that's on my phone, I could use some God's Word and some wisdom every day, right? Right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna text wisdom to this number up on the screen behind me or what you'll see on the slides on online. And I want you to text that number because you will get a proverb a day throughout this series. And it's gonna be great. It's gonna be that little touch of wisdom you need to start your day. Or it's gonna be that word that you needed on your heart that day that God knew you needed. So I want you to take the opportunity to do that. One more thing before we start to worship today. We were cleaning out the storage room and to your benefit, we have some shirts that I'm getting ready to toss out there. I promise not to beam anybody in the head with them. I'll do my best. I'll throw them underhand. I have been working out a lot. So if it comes really hard, I, I promise I'm, I'm try, not trying to, but I'm going to hand out some shirts and then we're going to worship together. All right. Ready? All right. I can't see. So if it goes to somebody or nobody, I don't know. All right. Ready? All right. One more. All right, you guys, let's stand to our feet and worship together. Y'all ready to worship with this? Come on. Lord, you're worthy. We're coming with open hearts. 
this together.
right? Cheer for her. She's excited to be up here. <laughs> and by excited, I mean nervous. But she's going to do great. It's going to be awesome. So Samantha here came to us last week and said, Hey, I have made the decision to follow Jesus with my life, and I want to be baptized. That's right. And I said, perfect, we'll sign you up for next week. Let's go. Um, she has had so many things going on in her life, and her and her husband have, have been on a journey together. And what she wanted me to share was just that she's ready to let go of that sinful nature, to overcome it with the help of Jesus, and to move forward in all the ways, in all the ways. And she told her mom to stop recording her. <laughs> But let me tell you what else, that's all she wanted to share. But just in the short time that I've gotten to know Samantha, there are things that I want to share also. In addition to her asking about baptism last week, she, she and her husband also asked about when they can get their children dedicated. And let me tell you what, this is one step, but what you're doing is setting the tone for your whole family. know here we value family. Kids are so incredibly important and you're making the commitment, you and your husband, to raise your kids in a godly way. With the support of your loving Bridge family, we're here for you guys for everything. But I just want to honor you for that because you are taking that step not only for yourself and for your life, but for the lives of your children and for your family as well. And so I thank you so much for sharing that with us today. And now we are going to baptize her and it's going to be amazing. And when we go under the water, you are going to stand up and cheer like crazy because this is a celebration, right? That's right. Let's do this.
you today. Lord, may we give everything we have to worship you, for you are worthy. Worthy you were, worthy you are. Forever you will be, even when we are so unworthy ourselves. You're loving even when we are so unloving. And Lord, as we sang earlier, our story is not about shame. Our story is about triumph because of what you did on the cross. And Lord, we celebrate new life today. We celebrate a life that is eternal. And we stand forever grateful. You are worthy of every name that we have sung to you today. You're worthy of so much yes, more yes, than that, yes. but please, please accept our worship, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, I pray over our hearts and our minds that we would walk out your word not only today, but forever. Lord, may we allow you to get rid of our shame and our guilt so that we can give us or give you our whole hearts. And we ask these things in the name of your Son, precious, holy Jesus. Amen. Welcome to church this morning. Can you feel the Holy Spirit in the place today? Can you feel the power of God? I don't know if you can feel that online. We're not about feelings here, but I tell you what, when, the, when, when God begins to speak, when the Holy Spirit begins to swell up on the inside of every believer, we want to respond to that. Is that something you want to do? I, I think much more important than you coming in and occupying a seat or turning on a device today is a response that we have to a God that wants to do something in your life that's going to change your life for the better. And when, when you get a, a person who responds to Jesus and responds, not just listens and hears, but what does the Bible say? Don't just be a hearer of the word, but a, a doer of the word. When, when, a, when a person in Christ begins to respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing in their life, that's whenever life change begins to happen for the better. We witnessed it right here with baptism. Samantha, I'm so proud of you. And if you could hear the whole story, we're only able to tell you a little bit of it. But this is somebody who has heard the word of God and then had the guts to get up in front of you today and and say, hey, I'm actually different. God's doing something in me. I, I don't just want to hear it. I want to do it. And I wonder if there's anybody in the room or watching online today that would say, I'm ready to respond to what God is saying to me. I'm tired of being a sea warmer. I'm tired of being a, 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 a weekend warrior. We say that for people that just play golf on the weekends, but don't do it anywhere else. I'm tired of that. I'm, I'm ready to respond to God's word. Is that you? Come on, I'm laying it on thick right here at the beginning. I ain't even got into the notes yet. But I tell you what, if, and hear this in love because I, I feel the same way about myself. God forbid we ever get to be a church that just comes in and has a good time on Sunday. Come on, I'm not here to tickle your ears. I'm not here for us just to have a good time emotionally. I'm here to have fun. I think Christians should have the most fun in the entire world, to be honest with you. But the reason why we have so much fun is because we're so close to a God that's doing change in our lives for the better. Is that you this morning? Come on, I heard one amen. I'm, I'm gonna work you this morning, amen? 
Amen. We're in a series called What I Deserve, and we're talking about and walking through stories in the Bible where people deserved one thing, but because of the grace and the love of Jesus Christ, they got something else. Aren't you glad for the grace and love of Jesus? And we're not just looking at it from a historical perspective, but we're also inserting ourselves into these stories because we deserved one thing too because of our sin nature about us, but because of the love of Jesus Christ, he gives us something else. And I wanna talk about a man today uh, in the Bible who actually was probably, if you look at it from a human perspective, probably did the worst. Now, again, God doesn't have a degrees, a degree of sin. One is worse than the other. It's just you're either worthy of them or you're not, and none of us are. That's why the perfection of Jesus Christ covers every single one of us. But if you look at it through a human perspective, it's easy to say, man, this guy really messed up bad. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you who it is. It's Peter, one of the 12 disciples who, if you read the scriptures, he was actually one of the top three in Jesus' inner circle. And he serves with Jesus for three years. He's beside him. And it gets to the night before Jesus is crucified and he denies him. He denies even knowing him. Doesn't just, you know, sort of accidentally kind of walk into something. He denies purposely even knowing Jesus. If, if there's anybody that deserved to be counted out in terms of being a church leader, in terms of when Jesus left and they established the church, if he's looking for people that's going to help launch that, Peter, having denied even knowing Jesus, probably wouldn't look at least on the outside like somebody we would choose to do that. He deserved to be counted out. But because of Jesus, man, he gave him a second chance. And can I just say, all of us have walked through things, maybe you're walking through something right now where you don't really feel worthy to be counted in as somebody Jesus would really look at as somebody to minister in his kingdom. By the way, we're all ministers, not just people on stages with microphones. Our lives should be ministering to people. All of us are called to share the gospel. But all of us walk through things where we just don't feel worthy to do it. Would you agree to that? Everybody should be shaking your head. In fact, I think there's a group of people that probably hit failure the hardest in terms of how we feel about it. And that's parents. You wanna feel like a failure? Raise kids. I promise you, if, you, if you've raised kids or are raising kids, you failed. Uh, when I was, let's see, my daughter was uh, one year old at the time. She's 17 now. But when she was one year old, we were coming back from the grocery store. It was just me and her. And she's in the back in a car seat. We had a van at the time, uh, a Dodge Caravan. Remember those? Those were nice. And we had a, a car full of groceries. And what I noticed on the way home was she began to go to sleep. Now, if you're a parent of a small child, especially a baby, and they go to sleep, you do everything in your power. It's like you have to master the art of doing any task without waking them up. That's what you do. Because if they wake up, then I just knew that I wouldn't be able to get her back to sleep. It was almost nap time. And if she woke up on the way home, man, there was gonna be no getting her back down. So what do I do? I do what any parent would do. I practice my ninja skills. I open up the back door when I pulled in the driveway, real quiet, got all the bags literally without making a peep. I'm so, this was parent stealth on steroids. I mean, I was doing everything I could. Pulled all the bags out, she's still asleep. I'm like, God is good. I shut the door very quietly, click, God is good. She's doing nothing. Man, I'm walking to the house feeling good about my parent skills. I mean, I walk in, put the groceries away, Here's where the problem came in. It was half an hour later when I remembered she was still in the van. And I was thinking the same thing you're probably thinking as I rushed out the door, is she okay? Is she still there? God, I hope nobody took her. And knowing what I know about Mia today, I I probably would have been asking, did she wake up and drive the van into town? She didn't do any of those things, thank God. But hashtag failure, I mean, we all fail. And I wish I could say that was the last and only time that I ever forgot my my kids somewhere. Uh, Have you ever been the parent that gets a call from the school? Like, hey, are you coming to pick up your kid? Am I the only one? Bunch of liars. Yeah, we... And you just feel horrible and you come in, you pull up and you feel so bad. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, my middle son, he had finished driver's ed, the driving part, and you're supposed to go pick them up when they get done driving. I completely forgot. It was the last day. I pull up, he's holding this certificate by himself on the curb and I feel like such a failure. Now that represents a small handful of times that I've done something like that. I promise it doesn't make up everything about me being a parent, but you fail as a parent. And there's many ways you can fail as a parent. That's just one of them. Uh, If you're wondering, Mia was okay. It wasn't hot that day. In fact, she was more mad that I woke her up from her nap. She was sleeping so good uh, than she was that I left her in there. 
But so often when we fail in life, they're not funny. Now I can tell you that and we can laugh because everything turned out okay. But you know what? Sometimes we fail and things don't turn out okay. We hurt people or we go back on what we said and failure stings. In fact, some of you probably feel the weight of some of the decisions you've made and you look back and it, it leaves you in a place that you never wanted to be. You made a promise to God and you broke it. You said you'd never do it again, but you did. You made a promise to somebody and you broke it. You left your family high and dry. Maybe some of you have, have left your families and you feel like, man, I said I'll, work wasn't gonna get too busy and yet I promised I was gonna do something and work got busy again and I left them hanging. For some of you, it's deeper than that. Some of you have broke some severe commitments to your family. Some of you have broke some, some uh, severe commitments to people you love. And you look back and you go, how did I get here? I didn't mean to do this. And you wish to God, come on now, you wish to God. We all have it when we look back and we wish that we could just go back and get a redo. If I could just have one day to go back and redo that, that's, that's what I would redo. And that must've been going through Peter's head because Peter, he deserved to be counted out. He went back on a promise that he made to God. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute, back to Jesus. And yet, because of the love and the grace of Jesus, he was given another chance. And I just wanna look at you because I think for some of you, this message is gonna bring some hope that you desperately need to know that God still has great things in store for you, even though you failed miserably. Somebody say amen to that. Because this is what I want you to know right off the bat is that God will give you another chance. Somebody say hallelujah. Come on, I want you to hear it. Not just, not God will give your neighbor a second chance. He might, but I want you to personalize this for you. It doesn't matter how far you've gone, God is in interested in where you're going more so than where you've been. And when you come to him in repentance, I'm already getting into it. He will give you another chance. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. You may say, well, pastor has been too long for me since I've walked with him. He will give you another chance. I, I've sinned too many times. I failed too many times. If you, God looks at my track record, he knows it. Certainly I can't be counted worthy. Hear me. He will give you another chance. And for some of you, you think, well, my second chance is just going to be to come in and maybe sit in the back row or maybe just skirt in by the, the, the hair of my teeth, as I heard somebody say one time. No, he wants to make you stronger than ever before. He wants to give you not only a second chance, he wants to make your life beautiful, better than new. That's what God does because of the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And he wants to do that for you. The night Jesus was arrested, he had just been in the upper room with his disciples. Some of you maybe remember the story. They celebrated Passover, which was a Jewish feast. And afterwards, they head over to the olive grove where uh, Jesus would eventually be arrested. But on the way there, Mark records that Jesus said to his disciples, he looks at him and he says, tonight, all of you are gonna fall away on account of me. In other words, all of you are gonna scatter. And I don't think they understood to the fullness what he was actually talking about, what was actually gonna happen. But he said, all of you are gonna fall away on account of me. And Peter, who honestly loved Jesus, looks at him and says, no, 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 everybody else may fall away, but I will never fall away. I'm never gonna leave you, I'm here. You ever had somebody say that to you? You know when it matters? When the rubber meets the road, when things get tough. In fact, Peter, in Luke chapter 22, verse 33, look at what he says to the Lord. They record it. He's talking to Jesus. Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you. Now, that might seem interesting today and nice today because of all the conveniences prison has. But back then, you'd have been beaten. You'd have been in some very severe circumstances in an environment that was nasty. He was saying, I'm ready to put up with the worst circumstances that life has to offer with you, Jesus. In fact, I'm ready to die with you. This is what Peter said to Jesus just hours before he was arrested. And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, in other words, it's not even gonna be 24 hours and you're gonna de de deny three times that you even know me. So the night goes on, Jesus gets arrested. And if you know how the story goes, uh, Peter did exactly what Jesus said he would do. He denied him. Skip down to verse 54. It says they come and they, they arrest him. They arrest Jesus. They led him to the high priest's home. And Peter did what? Come on, I want you to say it out loud. I'm working you today. What did Peter do? Followed he followed at a distance. I want you to remember that. That's gonna be important in just a minute. 
So the guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. So imagine they go from the garden to the high priest's home, and if you can imagine this house, it would have had a courtyard like many rich people had there, and uh, there, everyone was really welcoming during that time. People sort of milled around, and there's a fire in the middle of the courtyard. Peter sort of blends in with the crowd. Jesus, if you, if you look at archaeology, he's probably 20 feet at the most, maybe 30 feet away from where Jesus is being uh, tried right there in an illegal trial, by the way. And he's warming himself by the fire, trying to blend in. During that time, a servant girl noticed him in the firelight and she began to stare at him. Something's familiar about this guy. And she said, hey, this man was one of Jesus' followers, but Peter denied it. Woman, I don't even know him. And after a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, I'm not, Peter retorted. And about an hour later, somebody else insisted, this must be one of them because he's a Galilean too. But Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster began to crow. So he's there for hours and that's, that's how it happens. We don't mean to get into something. We don't mean to get into sin. We don't mean to deny the name of Jesus Christ with our actions, but it happens over time and it's a slow fade. And it happened with Peter. He denied even knowing Jesus. And here's the interesting part about this story. He didn't accidentally do it. He didn't sort of wander accidentally into this. He purposely denied him. Does that sound like somebody that deserves to be used by God? Somebody that denies him on purpose? Come on, some of us are, are, are looking at our own lives and we're saying, I don't deserve to be used by God because I didn't sin on accident. I didn't accidentally give in to temptation. I did it on purpose. And there was a part of my life where I was, maybe you're saying, I... I I did it on purpose. I, I said, hey, I'm having a better time here than all them church folk are having. And that's what Peter did. Denied him out of fear. I wanna show you a crucial mistake that Peter made. And I wanna show you how we can keep from making that same mistake, how we can learn from it in our own lives. Here's the mistake he made. You said it a minute ago. He followed Jesus at a distance. Did you know that the truth is we get to choose how close we are to Jesus? And some people wanna be really close to Jesus. They choose to be close. Well, they get up in the morning and the first thing they do is say, I gotta have the word of God right after the coffee pot. But they go to the coffee pot, then they immediately, <laughs> they go to the word of God. In fact, they, they need the word of God so much that even when they wake up late and they're running out the door, they grab the word. They just gotta get at least one verse. I gotta read God's word. I gotta get it in my heart. I don't wanna be far from him. They, they sense him in their lives because they're close to his word. They, they sense him in their lives because they're submissive to the Holy Spirit. And they say, I want the Holy Spirit to lead me. They have the heart of David that said, I, Lord, test me, look at my heart and see if there's anything unpleasing to you. Show me what it is. I wanna be on the cutting edge of what you're doing. And Christians like that, man, they, they know God's working in their lives. And it's one of the most joyful things because they know that God's working for them. They know there's nothing in between them and God. They're not following at a distance. They're following close. Someone who's following this close, they, they want to be right next to the action of what Jesus is doing in their lives. But can I be honest with you? Some people don't choose that at all. Some people choose to live at a distance from him because it's a lot more convenient and it feels a lot better to our flesh. I want to talk to you lovingly as your pastor for a minute because I've been there too and I get it. It's a lot easier to follow him from a distance. It's a lot easier to just attend church services and say that I'm good with God and God is good with me because I've done something Christian today. But yet when it comes down to the sin in our own lives, we're unwilling to give it up. When, it, when the rubber meets the road, like Peter, when things got the toughest, we're unwilling to surrender to him. Come on, it's easy to worship God in a church service. Everything's done for you. Pastor Terrell and the team, they come early. They've been practicing during the week. We have air conditioning. We have people greeting you at the door. We got padded seats. You just take it in. But man, when Jesus begins to nudge you about your spending habits, and we say, Jesus, I want to keep you out of that. Follow him at a distance. It's easy to turn on a podcast and hear about God because someone's don't doing all the work. You're just sort of listening and receive it. But when God convicts you financially to give to those in need or to tithe according to his word or to give up and sacrifice, that's when we begin to say, you know what? It's easier and more convenient to follow at a distance. Can I get a little deeper? It's easy to be in a bridge group. It's easy to come to a bridge group and get fed and to fellowship with other people and put on a mask, but yet still reserve for yourself the right to hold on to secret sins that nobody else knows about, but Jesus knows about them. 
and he's wanting to be close to you, but we're holding him at arm's length. It's easy to follow him at a distance with the best things in our fleshly lives, but yet convict us the most. But you know, being close to him, that's really where we find the best experience. But we're fooled into thinking that if we hold on to this, it's gonna be easier and better. But Jesus wants you to come close because he knows the best experience that you're gonna have in this life is one that's lived close to him. I've had in my life the privilege of going to two NBA basketball games. And if just in case you're wondering, I didn't play in them because I know some of you look at me and think I'm just a hooper, but I'm not. <laughs> two games. The first game I sat in general seating. Uh, it was Michael Jordan's last season. He played with the Washington Wizards. If you guys follow Michael Jordan at all, greatest basketball player ever. I don't care what you say. He's the greatest. And I got tickets to go see the Washington Wizards and the Charlotte Bobcats at the time when they were still the Bobcats. And you know, if Michael Jordan's not going, nobody wants to go see the Wizards and the Hornets duke it out, the Bobcats at the time. We were going because MJ was there and we paid money way ahead of time. We drove the three hours it takes to get to Charlotte. We had a whole car full of people only for Michael Jordan the week before to get hurt because he was getting older. He didn't even show up to the game. And we were sitting in the nosebleed sections. It was horrible. They're like the two worst teams in the NBA, watching them duke it out in Charlotte and Michael Jordan's not even there. And I thought, why are we here right now? It was the worst experience ever. Somebody else's trash was on the ground. I felt like I was watching the game from, from the hood, to be completely honest with you. And I'm in there and I'm looking at this and I'm watching these guys. Look, I can see it better from my TV. It was horrible. And I thought, well, I'm never doing this again. A few years after that, my cousin uh, moved to Charlotte and he was actually really, he got a job working for the Bobcats uh, as the manager over VIP ticket sales. Uh, and we're close, my first cousin, love him to death. If you're watching, whoop, whoop, what's up, man? And he got us tickets to go see the, the Bobcats and the New York Knicks come, came to town. So we were like, hey, let's go see the Knicks play. Except for in this scenario, I had a wristband. That's something I didn't have in the first game. Now, if you don't know anything about a wristband when you go to one of these games, you walk up to that guy in the suit that's blocking the way to the aisle that leads down to the court. And he says, what are you doing here? And I'm like, and he looks at that wristband. And he says, right this way, sir. And you walk, you walk by with a little swag, you know, you're not, because you know you're getting ready to be in something. You're, you are important. And it's not just that, but we walk down and normally like where you stop, because that's the only thing you can afford, we pass that. And I'm walking down and the court's getting bigger and the, and the people that are already down there are getting bigger. And it's almost like I'm sitting right next to you. And I'm looking, I'm saying, this is going to be awesome. And so we're sitting on this row, so close, in fact, that if you go back and watch the ESPN highlights, you can see us, we're there. And I didn't realize that the players, one, smelt that bad, and two, they cussed as bad as they did, but they do. I could hear the, the play the coach was calling in the huddle. I almost wanted to scream it out because I could hear what was going to happen. It was so cool. And we were so close, in fact, that the general manager of the New York Knicks was sitting on the end of our row. It was really early in the season. He was checking out some of the talent the team had. He was sitting right on the end of our row. Another thing that the wristband got you into, because you didn't know this happened, unless you get VIP seats, we got to walk down on the court side and go into the tunnel where the players come in and out. And back there is like a whole restaurant reserved for guess who? Wristband people, okay? And you go back there, all the Dr. Peppers you can drink. Sound a little like Forrest Gump right now. But they, all the Dr. Peppers you could drink, a whole buffet of food. And I walk, must have walked in there probably 10 times during the game. In fact, every time I walked in there, I had to make the general manager of the New York Knicks move because he was at the end of my row. And I'm like, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm really proud of myself for being able to make a man of your stature move out of the way so that I can get by. It looks like I'm getting ready to flip somebody to the bird every time I do that, but I promise I'm talking about my wristband. <laughs> And here, that wasn't even the best part. So I'm in the tunnel coming back right before halftime and I'm standing there and all of a sudden the security guard comes and blocks off the tunnel and because halftime is getting ready to happen and the players are getting ready to run back in. So I'm literally standing in the tunnel. All they have is the little ropes that are right here and the horn blows and I'm standing there holding my drink and here comes the players running in and they are fast. They are tall, tallest people I've ever seen in my life. The shortest one was like this tall. And I'm looking up at him and I just can't believe, I'm like, this is what David must have felt like when he hit Goliath. Like, these are huge. You think you know tall, you don't know tall. And all of a sudden they clear out all of them and the, cloud, the crowd kind of clears and guess who's sitting right about 10 feet in front of me on the end of the Hornets bench? 
<laughs> you say it again. MJ himself is sitting there and we lock eyes and have this intimate moment for about three seconds. I'm like, there he is, Michael Jordan. And I'm like, why didn't you come to the Wizards game all those years ago? I didn't say that. And I'm walking past him and I'm like, there's the goat. There is Michael Jordan. And I'm all because of what? The wristband. All because of what? Being close to the game. If you want to live your best experience at a sporting event, get as close as you can. And I'm thinking that's the same thing when it comes to Jesus Christ. Don't follow at a distance because the best experience you're ever going to have is when you're close to him. That's what he offers. He don't just offer you a second chance when you come to him. He offers you an opportunity to get close, to experience him in a way that you've never experienced him, to have the most joy you've ever had in your life. Circumstances don't change that because I've got a joy down deep on the inside of me. I quote Paul a lot, but he said, you know what? Circumstances make my outside just fade away. He said, but down deep, there is a joy that's being renewed every single day. Why? Because I'm close to the Savior. I'm not following at a distance. I'm close to him. I want to know him. I want to know the ins and outs of what makes him tick. I want to know his heartbeat. I want to get into his word. I want to hear him speak to me. Come on, is there anybody that wants to live close to him like that? Being close makes a difference. I think it's interesting that Peter, when he denied Jesus, was following at a distance. But just a few hours before that, if you remember the story, when they came to arrest him, he was right by Jesus' side. He was close to him. And he didn't deny him then. He pulled out a sword and cut off the, the servant of the high priest's ear. He's like, you want to take my guy? Come on, you're going to have to get through me first. I'm ready to die. Why? Because he was close to him. Now, Jesus did something weird. He picked up the guy's ear and plopped it back on and healed him. And it was a great time. <laughs> He said, Peter, we're not doing that this way. Am I not to drink this cup that God's given me? But what made the difference for Peter? Proximity, closeness. And I can just say right now, for some of you, you're following Jesus at a distance. And the more you do that, the more you're gonna understand that you are not gonna get the full goodness of Jesus that he has to offer. You're not gonna get the full blessings that he has to offer. Peter's mistake was that he followed Jesus from a distance and it cost him. He denied even knowing him because of that. And verse 61 is heartbreaking, if you can imagine it. He's there in the courtyard. He denies Jesus for the third time. Look at what it says in verse 61. It says, at that moment, the Lord turned and he looked at Peter. Again, he was about 20 or 30 feet away. Suddenly the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you're gonna deny three times that you even know me. And the Bible says that he left the courtyard and he wept bitterly. I want you to imagine that for a minute. Jesus just over there is being tried and Peter's over here trying to blend in, denies him that he even knows him. Not once, not twice, but three different times denies that he even knows him. In fact, one of the gospel writers record that he said, may a curse fall on my head if what I'm saying is not true. And at that moment, Jesus turns and he looks at him and Jesus' face probably would have been black and blue by now, having been slapped and hit, maybe even bloody. And here's the savior who's never failed Peter, always been faithful to Peter. And now Peter's looking back at him through sad eyes because now he knows he has failed and not been faithful to him. And the weight was so heavy on him, he couldn't take it anymore. The Bible says he left and he wept bitterly over what he had done. Can I just ask you, church, when's the last time you wept bitterly over your own sin? When is the last time that it got so heavy for you that you said, you know what? I can't live like this. I need something different in my life. I'm not talking about remorse where I just feel bad about it. Anyone can feel bad about getting caught. Anyone can experience feelings. I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about the other R word and that's repentance. That means I come to him and I actually want to make a a turn. I want to turn from what I was doing. And it's when we say, Lord, I don't want this as a part of my life anymore. I want you more than I want me. And it doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you're not going to struggle. It means I desperately, way down deep, don't want to break your heart anymore. I want you to take me and use me for your purposes, oh God. It's a turning from our old life. Hear me loud and clear. When I'm not sensitive to the horror of sin in my life, that's when I begin to follow Jesus at a distance. But when I'm following him closely, when I want to be close as possible, that's when I begin to become keenly aware of my sin and I repent quick. I come to him quick. I repent deeply because I feel the weight of what I've done. Peter felt the weight of it. He said, I don't want to live like this. It caused him to flee and run and weep bitterly because he knew he had broken the heart of Jesus. 
You need to hear me, church. It's important that we divide the difference between feeling bad over sin and turning from sin, repenting from sin. He's not God. He's not interested in remorse. He's not interested in that anybody can feel bad about what we've done. God is interested in surrender. He's interested in you pouring your heart out to him saying, I don't want this for me and I know I've broken your heart. I give myself to you. That's what makes a second chance possible. Peter made a bold promise and then broke it. He absolutely deserved to be counted out. But because of the grace of God, Jesus didn't count him out. He gave him another chance. And we find this chance happen days later. Jesus went to the cross. He died. We don't know who was there. We know John was there. We know some of the women were there, Jesus' mother and Mary Magdalene and some other women. We don't know where the disciples were. Jesus said, all of you are gonna scatter on account of me. Jesus' own family, besides his mom, wasn't there. We don't know if Peter was there. He dies, he raises from the grave, as you know in the story. And the Bible says he was on earth about 40 days before he ascended back into heaven, presented himself to over 500 people, eyewitnesses that can account that Jesus is in fact alive in case there's anybody that ever wants to dispute it. And during that 40 days, he did something interesting. Jesus is doing all that. And Peter and his disciples, or excuse me, Peter, one of the disciples and some of the other disciples, they were fishermen. They decided to go fishing. And Jesus comes to where they are. He's on the shore and they haven't caught anything all night. And Jesus calls out to them. They don't know who he is yet. He's far enough away. They can't see him. Maybe they were kept from knowing who he is right away. And he says, hey, why don't you cast your net on the other side of the boat? And if you're a fisherman or ever been fishing, it's pretty much the same thing. Like, why are you coming to cast my net on the other side? And they did it. And sure enough, they raked in more fish than the nets could even hold. And they knew immediately there's Jesus over there. And Peter, look at what John 21, beautiful chapter, verse seven says, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he jumped into the water and he headed to the shore and the other stayed behind and pulled the loaded net to the shore. I want you to understand something. Peter knew he had failed. He probably was walking those three or so days, knowing the weight of what he had done, feeling guilty about what he had done, the heartbreak of the failure that he had, denying the very one that that he knew was the Messiah and saved him. And yet he didn't run from him. As soon as he knew it was Jesus, he jumped into the water, left a perfectly functioning boat to get there because he knew, you know what? This boat's not gonna get there as fast as I can. And that's what we need to do whenever we know we failed and we need a second chance, even though we don't deserve it. Jesus will give it to you and you need to get close to Jesus. Get close to Jesus. If you've gotta jump out of a boat, so to speak, if you've gotta leave, whatever it is, friends you have, it doesn't matter. You do whatever it takes to get to him. Peter didn't care what they thought. He left the boat. They're they're in there going, what are you doing? Peter said, I'm getting wet because you're not gonna get there as fast as I wanna get there. You don't need to care about what other people think. You don't need to care that someone says, well, I know what you've really done. Who cares? The only opinion that matters is is the opinion of the risen Savior who died for you. And he says, you are worthy of a second chance. Get close and get there as fast as you can. He gets to Jesus. And if you read that chapter, he has this extended conversation with Jesus. And he says, Peter, do you really love me? Do you love me, Peter? And there's so much in that. But at the end of that, he says, if you love me, Peter, then feed my sheep. In other words, I'm calling you back into this ministry that I put you in. You don't deserve a second chance. He didn't say that. I'm saying it. Maybe you feel like you don't deserve it. But Jesus said, I'm pulling you back in, worthy to be counted in, worthy to be counted as a part. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, Peter. He qualifies him to serve in the kingdom. Some of you don't feel qualified to serve in the kingdom of God. Well, I'll just be a part of the church. If you'll just accept me as a part of the church, then that'll be good enough for me. God not only wants you to be a part of the church, he wants you to serve and be active in the church. He wants you to be an influencer for the kingdom of God. And he takes the least of these and puts them at the front line sometimes. And he says, oh, it's not gonna be about the guy or the gal that's on the stage with the microphone that's gonna make the biggest difference. It's gonna be somebody you pray for. It's gonna be somebody that you look at and give a smile to because the Bible says a joyful look can bring joy to a heart. And when it's in used by the Holy Spirit, even a cup of water given in the name of Jesus won't go without its reward. And God's kingdom will flourish because of the least of these doing something. 
So if you feel guilty, if you feel ashamed, if you don't feel like you have anything to offer, you run to Jesus, get as close as you can. Let him give you that second chance that you've been longing for. He's willing. And let him qualify you once again to serve in his kingdom. Peter, the failure at this point, Jesus restores him and he becomes something powerful. Maybe he was thinking, well, maybe I'll just, you know, be a part of the other disciples and help lead. Did you know that by the time you get to the Acts chapter two, which is, it picks up where the story leaves off, Peter preaches the first message and 3,000 people get saved. And it's an impromptu message. Man, I, I study all week and maybe some people will respond to it. I hope so. It's God if it does, and we certainly celebrate it. But this impromptu message that Peter preaches, 3,000 people get saved and the church is launched. What qualified him to do that? The guy who denied Jesus, the guy who failed, the guy that didn't deserve a second chance. But yet when he ran to God, when he ran to Jesus, there was nobody better qualified when Jesus says you're qualified. Nobody better qualified to preach a message of repentance and forgiveness than the one who failed desperately and gave himself to Jesus once again and was forgiven because of repentance. Did you know that the things that you feel disqualify you the most when you put them in God's hands and he forgives you and you repent and turn, those become the places, the most powerful places in your life that God can use to minister to other people? Come on, you may walk through many tests in this life, but God's trying to turn those things into a testimony. He's trying to turn them into a story. He's trying to turn them into something that you can use and you have credibility because you've walked through it and said, if God can do it for me, he can certainly do it for you. Come on, there, there is nobody more credible to speak to a drug addict than somebody that's been saved and delivered from drugs. There is nobody more capable to speak to financial prosperity and getting out of debt and obeying God's word when it comes to finances than somebody who is trapped in debt and doing finances the wrong way, but they struggled and they strived after the Lord and watched God provide. And now they said, if I can get here, you can get here too. Nobody better to look at when it comes to what a marriage is supposed to be than somebody who has done it wrong, but yet through the grace and the power of God, redeem somebody. Redeem somebody who's committed adultery. Redeem somebody that's walked out on their family and, and experiences the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And I know every marriage doesn't work. It's statistical. I, I don't know why, because it takes people, but it's not because Jesus didn't want it to. Jesus has the power to do something in your life if you'll come to him. And those things, the places that you thought disqualified you, those things become the places of strength when Jesus gets a hold of it. I heard a preacher one time say, never put a period where God puts a comma. Never, never put a period on the end of your sentence saying, well, this sentence is over. In other words, God can't use me anymore. This is it. If I become a Christian, I have to sort of look back and never, never remember those things again. No, God says, I'm putting a comma there. The story is gonna go on. The story of your life isn't over. In fact, you're gonna remember those things and those are gonna be the things that I use to help you minister to other people that are walking through the same stuff. They're the places that your testimony begins to help other people. The very things that you think disqualify you from serving in God's kingdom, when you bring them to God and you begin to live close, they cause you to worship him with more fervor. They cause you to look at him and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Oh, your heart thought you could worship him. But when you begin to remember what he's pulled you from, man, the worship and the praise begins to come from a place that you didn't think existed. A grateful attitude, a grateful heart becoming a joyful heart. That's what God wants to do in you. And you have that because you remember what he's pulled you from. See, Satan would like to look at you and say, hey, remember those things? They disqualify you. And those are lies. He wants to look at you and say, you know what? Those are the things that make you the weakest. When in fact, God says, in your weakness, I become your strength. If you've ever broken a bone, you know that the, the place of the break, when it begins to heal back, it's actually stronger than the rest of the bone. And in the same way, God takes our brokenness. He takes the places we feel unworthy. He takes the places that we feel counted out and he redeems them. And he actually makes them strong places in our lives. Under the blood of Jesus Christ, they become places that we minister from. Years later, Peter was a redeemed man. He had led the church for years and he writes several letters to the church. And in one minute and a moment of weakness before the second chance, before the grace and the love of God covered that, he's denying he even knows Jesus. But look at what happens in that strong place. Look at what happens in that place that was once weak, but God made strong. Listen to the different tone. First Peter four sixteen. this is the letter he's, he wants the church to know and he wants us to know today. It's no shame to suffer for being a Christian. 
the man that once denied him is now saying, praise God for the privilege of even being called by his name. I'm denying him one minute, but now it's a privilege to even know and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, if I've got to suffer for his name, you stamp Jesus on my forehead. It's a privilege to know him. If I have to live for him, I'm gonna live for him full to the fullest. I just wanna know his name and I want people to know me by his name. The one who was once weak and vulnerable, they become, he became strong at the point of his weakness. Why? Because it led to healing through a second chance that Jesus gives. In fact, Peter once denied Christ when it gets to the end of his life, he actually gives his life for the name of Jesus. He doesn't run from it. Tradition says that he was hung on a cross and he said that he didn't even feel worthy to die like his savior Jesus did. And tradition says they hung him upside down so that he could be hung different than Jesus because he didn't feel worthy. That's how much he clung to the name of Jesus. You know, he was once weak, but Jesus made him strong and he can make you strong today. He can give you that second chance. He's already wanting to give it to you. It's just up to you. Do you feel counted out? Do you feel like you need a second chance? I wanna say what I said in the beginning, God will give you a second chance. But just like Peter understood, it's not gonna happen by living at a distance, by living away from him. It's gonna happen by being close and repenting and accepting the forgiveness of God. He wants to draw you in today. He wants you to come close to him today. That's where it's gonna happen. Some of you have been living in guilt and shame. Maybe you're saved today even. Maybe you've changed since then, but that guilt still hangs on like it's a, a plague and you just wanna get rid of it. Can I tell you something? God can save you from that. In fact, David even said, you forgave the guilt of my sin. In other words, Lord, even hanging on to the guilt, knowing that you died for that, knowing that you don't even remember it anymore. Sometimes when we rehearse guilt in our heads and we let that sort of take over, that in itself can become something that pushes God away from us. And God is saying, I don't want you to feel like that. I don't want you to rehearse guilt in your head. I want you to come to me. And when I give you a second chance, it's done. I put that thing away. And the only thing you need to remember is what I pulled you from and how you can use that to help other people who may be going through the same thing. He wants you to be close. That's the only way that you remember that. It's the only way that weak place becomes a strong place in you, a place of ministry, is when you give it to him, come close and you receive that second chance and you go with it. The weak places can become strong. Is that what you need today? I think for some of you, you need to give your life to Jesus today. You've been living at a distance way too long. And I wanna pray in a second and give you the opportunity to come close to him and receive grace and receive salvation. Some of you never thought it would be possible. And if he can do it for somebody like Peter who denied him to his face, he can do it for you. Some of you who are saved or have been living at a distance, holding on to secret sins, and you know what they are and there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, but he is gently and convictingly, lovingly calling you out of that and saying, give that to me today. You're missing out on my best blessings and there's a wedge between you and I. Come on, I think today we need to, we need to as Peter did, weep bitterly over our sins. Maybe not with physical tears, but your heart needs to wrench a little bit. You need to understand the gravity of what it means to make a decision to uphold Jesus, the savior of the world at arm's length. The one who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords and we're holding him at arm's length. Come on, it's time to surrender this morning. It's time for some of you to say, I've done this long enough and I am coming to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who I proclaim to be my God and I'm giving him everything. He doesn't want half of you. He doesn't want 92.8% of you. He wants 100% of you. And the Bible says, when you seek him first like that, he'll take care of everything else. So if some of you are thinking, well, well, I don't know about this and that, and I don't know if I'll be able to do this and I don't know if I'm ever gonna get out of, Jesus will take care of it, you come to him and give him your hundred and let him take care of the rest. And I just want to say, I'm going to open up this, this place at the very front of this room. If you're here on site, you just need someone to pray for you today. Some of you need a physical act to say, I'm surrendering to you. And I don't know who that is, but it may be you. And I'm saying during this prayer, you walk up here, you run here, you do what Peter did. You jump out of the boat you're in and you get to him as fast as you can. And I'll pray with you today. Maybe you just need someone to pray for you. I'll be that person or someone, one of our team will, will pray for you. you. You do it if that's what you need to do. Let's pray together. Father, we need you. 
Thank you for your word that says that you give us a second chance despite the things that we have done on purpose to you. Lord, when we come to you in repentance, when we come to you and want to turn and a change, Lord, you come and you give us that second chance. Forgive us for trying to feel some sort of joy in our feelings when what we really need to be doing is finding the everlasting joy in our spirits that can only come from turning to you and getting close to you. Lord, I'm talking to a group of people and I myself am included in that group that need to come closer than what I've ever been before. Lord, for some of us, we need to come to you for the first time and say, take my life, Lord, take all of it. I surrender to you today. I believe that you're Jesus, who is the son of God, who died a real death and rose from the grave. I put my faith and my trust in you and nothing else. For everybody else, maybe you're a Christian today and you just need to say, I, I, there are things in my life that I need to surrender to you. I, I no longer wanna live at arm's length with any sort of wedge in between me and you, Jesus. So I give that to you today. I come close to you today. I wanna receive the best of what you have for me today. In this moment, I want a second chance at this, Lord. And I know that you give it to me. And I come to you today and ask for it. I, I surrender to you today. Lord, we need you. And Lord, we love you. Come on, if you agree to that, just tell him in your heart or with your lips, I love you, Jesus. And the word of God says, if you love him, then obey what he says to do. Come close to him today. We give you all the praise and the glory, Lord, and we give you the praise and the worship that you deserve. Lord, not just for changing our hearts and giving us a second chance, but if you never did another good thing for us, you're still God. You're still worthy of our praise. You're still King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're still high and, and you're still lofty and way above anything we could ever even imagine. And in faith, we just honor you today with our hearts. Draw close to us, God as we draw near to you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Can we get a good amen in the house today? Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today at the Bridge Goldsboro Online. Please don't forget to let us know how we can pray for you, how we can love on you, how we can get you involved with the bridge and help further along your journey with Jesus Christ by filling out the online connect card found in the chat below. We love you, we are praying for you, and please, please come join us next week. Have a great day.